Hello there, many thanks for joining us in the Tuesday edition of Business Nigeria. Here are some of the biggest stories we're tracking for you at this time. Now, the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Issa Pantami, rejects phone call tax. Made other calls as Haytham al assumes office as the new OPEC Secretary General. And still staying on the international front, Asian stocks slide today with the U.S. yields on Nancy Pelosi jitters. On the interview segment on the show today, now we'll start a conversation looking at the state of the Nigerian economy with a view and analyzing Nigeria's current external reserve base, the needs for stronger economic buffer, and for the second half of the show, we'll be evaluating the overall performance of last year's budget, this year's budget implementation, and also the effect of budgetary allocations and projects executed by the federal government. Welcome to the show. Let's now bring you up to speed with some of the news making the headlines today. The Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Sepantemi, says is against attempts by the federal government to introduce a 5% excise duty on telecommunications services. He said this while speaking at an event in Lagos, maintaining that the move will impact the sector and Nigerians at large negatively, adding that the telecom sector already contributes a lot to the Nigerian economy and urges the government to reconsider tax and other sectors of the economy that are not contributing as much to the national development of the nation. He however notes that the timing is wrong and extra hardship on Nigerians wouldn't be tolerated. It will be recalled that the federal government had recently announced plans to implement a 5% excise duty tax on telecom services at a stakeholders forum on the implementation of excise duty on telecommunication services in Nigeria. And now in the energy sector, barely 24 hours after assuming office as the new Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Kuwait's Haytham al Gais has engaged the Nigerian media on his immediate plans for the global oil and gas industry. Addressing journalists in a virtual event at the organization's secretariat in Vienna, the new OPEC boss disclosed that the 600 million Africans currently without electricity must be considered while the global discussions on the current energy transition are ongoing. While also underscoring the critical role Nigeria plays in OPEC and its pivotal place in the African oil and gas market, he also promises to visit Nigeria soon, maintaining that with the cooperation of Nigeria and other member nations, OPEC will weather the storms in the global oil market. He, however, also described the ongoing construction of a regional gas pipeline that will convey Nigeria's gas to Nigeria Republic, Algeria, and then to Europe as a significant development, stressing that any assistance to be rendered to the continent must be collectively discussed and agreed upon by all stakeholders in OPEC. And now looking at the currency market, the Naira appreciated against the U.S. dollar at the parallel section of the foreign exchange market selling for 695 Naira to the U.S. dollar. According to a report from the broader charge operators, the figures represent a gain of 12 Naira, or an equivalent of about 1.7% compared to the 707 Naira it had earlier traded. The traders put the buying price of the dollar at 608 naira and then selling price at 695 naira, leaving a profit margin of about 15 naira. The however attributes the appreciation and value of the naira to the adequate availability of dollars in the market to meet demand. Now recall that the Central Bank of Nigeria stopped forex sales to BDC operators earlier in July last year, accusing them of being involved in illegal finance flows and money laundering in Nigeria development that has since seen the value of the Naira depreciating. Well, it's about our time now where we bring you the first conversation for today. Now, according to movement to the latest reserve data released by the Central Bank of Nigeria, the country's external reserves added $45.3 million in the month of July, moving to $39.22 billion from the $39.17 billion it had earlier commenced the month under review with. Despite the increase in price of crude oil, Nigeria's external reserves have depreciated by $1.3 billion in seven months of this year to hit $39.22 billion as of July the 29th from the $40.52 billion at close last year. Now, the foreign exchange buffer of the CBN in January was hovering at about an average of $40 billion and a later slid to about $39 billion in three months. That's between February 
and April this year before reaching $38 billion in May this year. Meanwhile, they attributed uh, the, the, we have the steady increase in the XNR reserves also being attributed to the CBN's RT200 uh, foreign exchange program, a policy that has revived foreign exchange earnings from non oil proceeds. Well, it's quite an interesting conversation we have today and joining me now virtually as we discuss this and bring more insight into the latest development we have in the currency market as well as the nation's external reserves. I have Senior Manager at Deloitte, Damilola Kimbami. Thank you very much for joining us on the show this afternoon, ma'am. For having me. Good afternoon. Now, let's start our conversation really now with the first seven months of this year, the performance we've seen in terms of the external reserves growth trajectory and also some decline movement. How would you rate the current economic buffer here in the country, in Nigeria, doing a comparative analysis of what has played out so far, really? We have to take a look at debt servicing and also petrol subsidy continuing to read the country of so much of gain. Of the external reserves so far this year has been very volatile. We've had periods of accretion and periods of depletion. And if you look at the year to date um, analysis, um, the depletion in the external reserves is about, um, let's say, 3.2%, which is roughly about $1.3 billion from $40.52 billion at the end of 2021 up till um, what it is right now as at the end of July, which is um, about $39.22 billion. And basically, these are just the gross external reserves figures that we are talking about with an import cover about 8.9 months. So what that means is that the level of external reserves is just sufficient enough to cover an import bill for roughly nine months. And like I said, this is the gross figures. If you look at the net external reserves figure, that is when you take out the limited, um, the contingent liabilities rather, um, so with, for, for instance, the swap deals and what have you, the figures that we're going to see would be actually worse and lower than the $39 billion, billion that we have right now, which paints a very disconcerting picture for because our net ex external reserves are at least lower than $30 billion. And while we having this depletion on depletion in external reserves, one, there's the growing demand backlog. Um, we, we are all aware of the on, on repatriated funds of the airlines and also of international companies. And this is occurring as a result of dwindling foreign um, exchange receipts. And that is because of one, um, lower oil um, earnings, and that's because of the oil theft that we're experiencing, which is limiting the price gains. Also, we know what is happening in the global market with the interest rates in increasing globally. So that is driving that reversal of capital funds away from emerging markets like Nigeria. So we have a situation where demand is growing, demand is increasing. However, what is coming in, the forex receipts are actually declining. And as a result, the impact on the external reserves would be a downward movement. Some interventions we've seen from the Central Bank of Nigeria, taking a look at the RT200 program and then the Naira for Dollar initiative just to have much more diaspora remittances. However, another question I'd like to ask is how problematic would you describe the situation where we have oil remaining our major foreign exchange earner? Because the current volatility in the oil market due to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, our missed per quarter and more, puts some more pressure on the uncertainty levels we'll have to deal with, wouldn't you say? So there are various um, sources of forex inflow into a country's external reserves um, level. So one, you have export earnings, so whether it's from oil or non-oil um, commodities like um, cocoa, cashew, um, sesame seeds in the case of Nigeria. You also have um, a situation wherein, I mean, you have foreign direct investments, foreign portfolio investments. But bear in mind that these are a function of perception. And as the saying goes, perception is everything, especially for foreign portfolio inflows, FPIs. Is, that's what we call hot money. So they are triggered by uh, uncertainty. And we call them hot money because as quickly as they come into the market at the sense or sign of the slightest um, hint of uncertainty, they also leave the market quickly. So definitely, if, if you're experiencing a decline in your FDI and your FPI, that would also affect the level of your external reserves. Another source of Forex is the diaspora remittances. In Nigeria, we've seen a re relatively marginal increase in um, diaspora remittances. One, because of the CBN's Naira for Dollar incentive, which definitely has had some positive impact. Also, because the dollar is strengthening as a result of um, Right, um, higher interest rates. So Nigerians in diaspora obviously um, will be able to send um, more money because of the value of the dollar that has strengthened. But as you rightly said, for Nigeria, 
oil still accounts for about 80% of our forex um, receipts. So as long as we are still dependent on oil and the environment, the country is exposed to oil market shocks, what's happening in the global oil market, what's happening in Nigeria, we're aware of the fact that because of the oil theft and pipeline vandalism, we haven't been able to enjoy the benefits of the price of the oil price increase. So as long as we still, I mean, oil continues to account for a significant amount of our forex receipts, we are still going to see that impact play out on our external reserves. Also now has to bring to the fore really now it's cliche to have to say we need to diversify an already diversified economy, but how then now, do we begin to expand the foreign exchange earner base like you've made mention of? We have to look at some of our cash crops and also other minerals where we make money from. And then the domestic revenue generation uh, strategy base beyond the current volume that we have. How do we begin to intrinsically expand this base beyond the old narrative? And especially taking into consideration that we have the uh, uh, Buari administration also wrapping up. This is an active election year. Next year, too, there's a whole lot of uh, sensitivities and uh, heightened emotions that will come into play just because of the election. So to what extent do you think we can expand our base and have much more policy uh, direction that is clear in terms of boosting the non-oil sector? Well, one is, I mean, increased focus on the non-oil sector. And we, we know that the government is already doing that in terms of driving more revenue or um, accruing or generating more revenue from, from, not, from the non-oil and also even boosting the forex receipts. And especially in a situation or at a time where the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is in place. So, I mean, the opportunities are enormous. So, for, for instance, in Nigeria now, our number one agricultural commodity export is cocoa. But however, we're like the fourth or fifth largest producer of cocoa. Ghana and Ivory Coast are the leading players. So one, I mean, do we have the competitive and comparative advantage to be able to unlock the benefits in this vast um, co commodity resources that we have at our disposal? Look at yam also. Nigeria is the largest producer of yam globally, but Ghana was the largest exporter of yam as at 2021. So that means that despite the fact that we're producing or we're the largest producer, we've been unable to generate that into revenue. So what we need to look into that, because that is one avenue to actually broaden the forex base and reduce our dependence on oil. Another one also is the non-oil, I mean, taxes, basically. That's another avenue for the government to generate revenue. And we know that at least, I mean, there's been increased an improved collection um, from the government. The, the government has become more efficient in its collection of taxes, which reflected even in the corporate income tax, which increased by about 35% in the first quarter of 2022. But bear in mind, there's the tax rate and then there's the tax base. And in Nigeria, Nigeria has the lowest VAT rate in Africa and one of the lowest tax revenue to GDP in, in Africa. So it's one thing to even increase your, your VAT rate, which we did a couple of years back, from about 5% to 7.5%. Another thing is also to widen the net base, the, the, the tax base, because one, most like, for instance, the corporate income tax that I mentioned, that's the formal economy. But Nigeria has a very large informal economy that are not fully captured in this tax base. So you need to get these people on board and also building public trust public perception about and confidence in the government. The people want to see what their, their taxes are being used for, what the proceeds are being utilized for. So for instance, are we seeing better roads? Are the roads well managed and maintained? Are there social amenities? So if we can clearly see what these tax proceeds are being used for, definitely the people will be more incentivized to pay their taxes. So I, I believe that, I mean, with the government's efforts in increasing um, its tax revenue to GDP, that to an extent would also help to reduce our dependence on oil, even for the fiscal part of the government's position. Talking about government's position as well, we've had to deal with this issue of policy somersault. Now, at a time where we're having the next day election, uh, building much more momentum, what's your prediction, especially towards the line of policy direction and also uh, continuity of working models and where we have policy somersault, we have to have a much more stable economic base and correct these narratives. What's your prediction here for Nigeria? So typically, I mean, in an election year, what you tend to see is a slowdown in the pace of implementation of economic policy. I mean, that's typically the norm. So, and especially when, I mean, public officials um, that should be in office and maybe they're running for they're running for office. So most of them is they're going to be on the campaign trail. So what you tend to see is that both economics and policy, they take the back burner because the focus is now on politics. And as we move closer 
to the election period, at least in Nigeria. We have just roughly six, seven months to the elections, which will occur next year, February. We are going to start to see that slowdown in the pace of implementation. Monetary policy, a lot of monetary policy authorities, what they tend to do, they tend to be apolitical, so they appear neutral and adopt a, a, a neutral stance, so they are not perceived to be in support of a particular party or, or the government, um, in, in, in the current government administration. Also, fiscal policy, I mean, we expect to see that the budget um, for 2023 will be presented to the to the National Assembly, I mean, maybe sometime in October, I mean, November. But any major or key reform that would, that would be implemented, if at all that would be done, we're going to see that occur between this month of August, September. But the closer we get to the elections, we start to see a slowdown in the pace of implementation of economic policy. Of continuity, especially with the new governments that will come into uh, that will resume office come next year. Yes. So again, depending, we don't know what the outcome of the um, election is going to be. So it's either going to be a, a status quo, a continuation of the current party, and um, handing over to a new administration on a different party. So depending on the outcome of the elections, that definitely will play a part and a role on the direction of policy. Let's also now look at conversations around the, <laughs> the free fall of the Naira against the greenback, especially within the uh, parallel market and other global currencies as well. Where lies the fate of the Naira now in the common months as we wait on improved output and overall economic recovery? Because really, at the end of the day, these sectors that need to be stimulated still need the Naira to stay afloat. I think what we should understand is what is driving this free fall in the currency. And it's just basically panic buying. Yet the other fundamental and underlying factors that are driving the sharp depreciation of the naira against the dollar. But as long as there's fear and uncertainty, that would always drive speculative activities, and that's what we're seeing at play. But bear in mind also, I mean, with the naira, let's say trading in the autonomous market at maybe let's say roughly seven hundred naira to a dollar, if customer A buys one thousand dollars, for instance, that's seven hundred thousand naira being mopped out of the system. So that tightness and liquidity obviously would limit customer A from coming back to the market. So that's going to sort of like provide some sort of threshold um, to this free fall or so, so, some sort of resistance to this free fall. So as long as, I mean, liquidity is tight and mo money is being mopped up from the system, which to an extent would help to, pre um, to create so, so, some sort of threshold. And we might not see the Naira fall further than that. But again, that is also subject to various factors, various underlying factors. And as long as those exchange dynamics are yet to be addressed, as long as we still have um, dwindling forex receipts, because the, the, the CDN's ability is subject to how much buffers it has. And if we continue to see a decline in the external reserves level, obviously the CDN's ability to support the, the, the currency will be constrained. So again, I mean, Naira liquidity at, at 700 Naira to a dollar or whatever it is, that is mopping up liquidity, and if narrow liquidity is tightened, that to an extent will address the demand um, pressure. Mm. And wrapping up our conversation just before I let you go now, let's look at the fate of the global economy. We have a looming recession, and everyone is in the space of preparing for a storm is coming, literally, for the fact that we all have to keep that notion at the back of our minds just because we don't know what is going to be the next uh, global disruption that would have. But in terms of how this would also affect uh, the external reserve base, to what extent do you think this lingering caution or warning of red flag that the Nigerian buffer should never have to get to that 30 billion threshold. How much of a noise do you think that should be in our heads and also preparing ahead of the next storm that will come or the next disruption? I think, I mean, the noise, I mean, the alarm bells are ringing already. I mean, everyone is fully aware of that. Everyone knows what is happening globally. And right now, the global economies, the, the stance that they have adopted, especially the, the monetary policy authorities, is that, is that of one of a tightening stance. And that's where we're seeing interest rates increase. I mean, so for instance, in the US, they've recorded two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So Technically speaking and theoretically speaking, that's a recession, but they are yet to call it that. So let, let's see what the Q3 numbers will be. So, but right now they are focused on addressing price inflation, which a lot of economies are also focusing on. So as long as these global economies continue to increase interest rates, they adopt a, a hawkish and contractionary monetary policy stance. That definitely would have an impact on Nigeria. One in a sense that Obviously, I mean, you start to see investors shift towards less risky environments and pull their funds out. Also, if you look at the, the unique 
um, features of Nigerian economy, what is happening here, also the, the uncertainty that is occurring as a result of policy uncertainty, the elections that are coming up, definitely that will put investors at bay and could limit the amount of inflows that we would see into the economy and into the external reserves. There are several remittances that I mentioned. It's also a function of the recovery globally, because if there's a recession or a slowdown in these um, countries, that would affect the level and amount of funds that could be remitted back home in the form of remittances. So, I mean, for Nigeria, what we need to do is also focus on what is happening um, in the country. We also have our own inflation issues that we're battling with. We have insecurity that we're battling with. So there are a lot of issues that we're battling with the elections that are coming up. And then there's also the issue of the forced subsidy and debt. And bear in mind that also our debt service burden is tied to what is happening in the global economy because higher interest rates obviously mean that the, um, our debt repayment um, burden would heighten. And remember what the, the Minister of Finance said, that our debt repayment um, exceeded what we earned as revenue. That is also concerning. So that's why I said, I mean, the alarm bells are ringing and I believe everyone can hear it. So we need to take action immediately. Thank you so much for your time on the show today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Damla Lakin Bami. She's a senior manager having... with Deloitte. And then we keep our fingers crossed to see how government is going to react to all of these intercases. But really, at this point in time, the alarm bells are ringing. Thank you once again. Now, Budget, a civic tech organization leading advocacy for transparency and accountability in Nigeria's public financial management space, has expressed concerns over the poor fiscal performance of the federal government's 2022 budget and gro the growing as subsidy payments. Now, going by the increase in rate of borrowings as debt to uh, revenue ratio, which has reached an alarming level within the first four months of this year, this has really raised more warnings in spite of giving uh, uh, the corrections by the International Monetary Fund and other uh, world bodies, which are also saying that the country is spending over 100% of its revenue on debt service. It's not functional. Now, unfortunately, those predictions are Nigeria's current realities. Now, the organization in a recent report called on the federal government to discontinue indiscriminate borrowing through ways and means, maintaining that it creates a ballooning set of interest payments run in parallel to the external debt as well as increasing the money supply and creating much more monetary volatility. Well, to discuss this and more burning economic issues, I'm now being joined live actually by Senior Research and Policy Analyst at Budget Nigeria, Bayala Kwaga. Thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me, David. Part of this conversation really now with budget stands over the fiscal performance of this year's budget and then the growing subsidy payments. What's your take on the budget implementation really now since we've seen the play out of the year 2021 and then the first half year duration of the year 2022 in terms of our markers, the issues of revenue leakages, project funding, especially constituency projects and more. Your thoughts on these? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and one for which a lot of Nigerians are interested in. The, the, the sad side of the story is that uh, for the constituency projects you referred to, about 100 billion was released. But unfortunately, over 50, 50 billion of that money was for empowerment projects. Now, we carry out uh, research in that regard on these constituency projects and what they are used for. And these empowerment programs do not really deliver development to Nigerian citizens. They are simply used as political tools in the hands of politicians to garner support and to garner potential votes for their you know, upcoming elections in 2023. So this is a challenge that we see uh, that really will affect the quality of governance. And it all, almost becomes like this is the settlement before the election to ensure that these votes are provided for. Still on the constituency projects issue, uh, TRACA, uh, budget sister organization that you know, takes into detail just what happens in constituency projects in their research, noted that about 41 of the projects that are earmarked as constituency projects have vague and unspecified locations. And this amount was totaled to about 4.89 billion. So you see that this is a prime example of this revenue leakage. If you cannot, if you cannot with uh, specificity 
and sure you know where money is going, it simply becomes a drain on the nation's resources. And you know, going back to the the issue you raised about the budget implementation for 2021 and the half year for 2022, uh, unfortunately, there really is no information. You know, there's no real solid information on budget implementation. All we have is a January to May uh, report, and that does not really cover or does not really provide information. You know, that Nigerians sorry January to April that Nigerians want to see. And the last quarter of 2021, you know, there is no information on that. So just how much was raised, just how much was expended, this is all information that Nigerians civil society does not have access to. The last information available to us, at least third quarter performance of the 2021 budget, still saw, you know, some variance in the negative areas. It's unknown if this was actually uh, covered and how much was even made, you know, and these conversations become all the more uh, compelling when we look at the revenue profile of the government and just how much they have been making. So, so by and large, there is or there still will be uh, lots of challenges in budget implementation and the problems seem not to be going away, I'm afraid. And now talking about this vagueness which you speak about, irrespective of this challenge, now the Nigerian government recorded an improvement in the 2021 open budget survey. Now this is attributed to its improved uh, timeliness in publishing budget documents, the improvements we've seen in inclusion and the budget processes, enhanced comprehensive documentation made available to the public, and even better institutional oversight roles in the budget process during the pandemic year. Is this really a commendable feat or anything to go by, would you say? <laughs> I mean, I, I think I would say that it is a commendable feat. It's, it's surprising that you know, Nigeria is scoring better. A lot of people <laughs> may share your your cynicism, but I mean, these are these are very serious things that affect the the quality of governance and the quality of citizens and government engagement. And the open budget survey is perhaps a specialized uh, metric that tries to measure three major things. It looks at transparency. It then looks at uh, oversight and then public participation. So, you know, these components try to measure just how open these documents are, how accessible they are, you know, for oversight, whether the institutions meant to be involved are being involved, whether there's adequate and appropriate oversight through audits and independent fiscal uh, institutions and public participation, really, how much, how, how meaningful is and how relevant is the participation of the public as it regards the budget process. And you know, it, it's public knowledge that a lot of these budget defense uh, periods or the, the times for budget, budget defense, the time allocated to budget defense is one in which you do not often see enough participation by Nigerians. So yes, there have been improvements, but if you look at the data, Nigeria is still or Nigeria still ranks below average, below the global average. So it's a snail pace sort of movement. It is commendable in and of itself that at least some things, some things are being done better than they were before. But it does really open the question as to how much more progress ought we ought, how much, how much more progress should we have made? How much progress should we should we think about making? in the future and what what would it take what does it take to actually close those gaps as regards transparency oversight and public participation Violet, let's now talk about forecasts and then what's playing out really globally with the fluctuations in the oil market and then this uh, unpredictable terrain of what could be the next global disruption which we've seen manifest from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. What sort of mindset shift now should we have in terms of budget implementation and then our expectation markers? You talk about the lack of data and information here, but with the element of new disruptions coming to shake up the global economy and a looming recession, what sort of markers do you think we have to put in place? I mean, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, really, that the, 
the inability of Nigeria as a nation to, to really reap the benefits of high oil prices, you know, has simply not been met. And at a period or any period where nations are, if you will, cashing out on the high oil prices, Nigeria is unable to simply make due with that. And, you know, this could not have come at a more op opportune time seeing as a lot of money had been expended during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the uh, Minister of Finance uh, said during a public consultation that the federal government was able to bring Nigeria out of recession, but she seemed not to have mentioned, or maybe have, maybe she omitted, that Nigeria borrowed its way out of that recession. So a lot of that money will have to be paid back at some point. And it's not going to be this present administration that will bear that cost, but the collectivity of Nigerians in the uh, coming fiscal years. So, you know, there is a, I mean, it's it's difficult not to be pessimistic about the, 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 the revenue profile of the government. Looking again at the fact that expenditures keep on growing, and one of them is the debt servicing. For the first four months of this year, according to the government's information, we are spending nearly two trillion on debt servicing. And you know, this really shows that we are actually paying more for debt, or servicing our debt more than we are earning in terms of revenue. So the, the, the old problems still remain. And these boil down to fiscal management and the prudence in which the federal government protects its main revenue sources, uh, one of them being crude oil. Why are we losing hundreds of thousands of barrels every day? And why is there nothing being done to ensure that pr production, oil production, is being ramped back up? Again, in the oil sector, the issue of subsidy and subsidy removal. You know, there are indications that the federal government is very inclined towards ending the subsidy payments or at least reforming it to some reasonable extent, which would free up trillions of naira. Uh, last year, the federal government uh, claimed that subsidy might take nearly four to six trillion naira for the entire 2022 fiscal year. And it's, it's difficult to comprehend just how that spending will be done alongside pressing national fiscal needs, education, infrastructure, other social amenities will likely suffer. So, you know, these are conversations, you know, around the oil sector and oil production that we need to have. Again, you know, the issue of, of debt servicing, Nigeria needs to become productive enough that it is earning way more than it is servicing in debt. So as we, as we progress or as we reach the end of the year, uh, it would not be surprising to see more dismal figures being released by the budget office. And I, I, I suspect that they would likely release a, a mid-year or a half-year report uh, any time from now. But uh, your guess is as good as mine that the, that, the, that the projections and the analysis will certainly not uh, be good for Nigerians. Now, Viola, I'm quite interested to have some updates here. Uh, let's have some status updates on budget's earlier report. Now, on the 460 duplicated projects worth well over $370 billion. Uh, and to what extent do you think such reports pull uh, government's attention to existing flaws in economic planning and uh, overall agenda for development? I mean, it's. One one of the the bright spots of budgets advocacy and you know the advocacy of numerous civil society organizations like ours is bringing information to the attention of the government, and uh, it would surprise you that oftentimes the federal government is you know carrying out this analysis itself, but for one reason or the other, uh, you know this information is not put out there. When budgets you know made that analysis and put that information in the public domain. There was initially some form of pushback uh, from the budget office, uh, but the ICPC stepped in and carried out their own their own independent investigation and came up with a slightly reduced number, but a large number in the hundreds. Nonetheless, you know that these that these duplicated projects exist. You know the budget office then did its own analysis and you know came to conclusion of a hundred so 150 uh, duplicated projects. And what became of that was there were no releases made for those line items. 
So it's like a two, three tier process where the budget is made, the, the, the cash calls are made, and then the money is dispersed. Uh, this, this money was budgeted, but there were no cash calls because the budget office did not even release the money in the first place. And I can say authoritatively that the budget office is, has really improved its budget oversight process in the uh, budget implementation management framework that the current administration has implemented, whereby they have better oversight and better supervision in some ways, or, or rather they have better supervision um, and maybe a bit of oversight in some ways in, in terms of advice, in terms of the, the process, in terms of the framework and the end product of uh, state-owned enterprise MDA budgets. And they are able to sort of uh, shepherd the MDAs, if you will, to put their budgets you know, in, in a good stead. Uh, as far as the, the, the highlights of that uh, report was concerned, the money was saved. And we believe that you know, the same will be done for the reports that budget released uh, early this year. Uh, with the 2022 budget, and we hope to see uh, more savings in that regard. But I would say that it's actually a very, very bright spot, and we see that as a win for civil society and for Nigerians. And hopefully the other reports that I would also have would definitely pull government's attention to what needs to be done in terms of thinking out of the box. We look at what global governments are also doing. Governments across the globe are taking much more strategic moves to ensure that the nip in the bud revenue leakages are much more critical of their spending. But now, as we are trying to prepare a clean slate for the incoming government, now let's talk about Nigeria's boring trend uh, to fund infrastructure and economic development. This remains one of the most uh, contentious issues we have to face in our development agenda. We've had cautions from the World Bank, we've had cautions from IMF, especially on the loan market volatility, but how much of a burden now would you describe these additional borrowings? How much do you think they'll place on the incoming government that has to face these myriads of problems of lingering forest scarcity issues, dwindling Naira value, and the overall slow economic rebound and as the noise of a looming global recession continues to grow louder? How much of a clean slate would I mean, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult. And, you know, in my informal conversations, people say that whoever becomes the president is going to take up a very unenviable job. Uh, in some way, uh, Nigeria may not have really had a choice as regards handling the COVID-19 pandemic. There really wasn't much money to begin with, but money needed to be spent nonetheless. I think the problem a lot of uh, Nigerians have is with the way in which these monies are spent there is an indication of rather there is evidence very clear evidence that the government is not cutting its coats according to its size you know with the way monies are being spent by political office holders and with the corruption cases that are rife in the media the the nigerian citizen does not see any sense of urgency or any sense of accountability really by the government or by government officials and i think that's where uh, the problem really comes from uh, with the issue of FX scarcity, you know, you have a problem that is really eating away at the very fabric of the Naira. And because of this scarcity and the knock-on effects it has, one of the most prominent problems it will produce that perhaps a lot of people haven't really considered is that it is simply eroding the value of the Naira to the point where the, the debts that we took and the interest, that, the interest that we pay on those debts would probably begin to balloon unless there was a clause in that borrowing or loan agreement that the, the, interest, rates or the, the interest rate would be pegged to a particular amount uh, of the a particular value of the Naira, I beg your pardon. So, you know, these are the fears that uh, Nigerians have. And, you know, in addition to this, the, the, the value or the size of the debt is the, is the debt servicing and how that affects or how that is affected by the value of the Naira. And there are numerous, um, nearly endless uh, reasons that the government needs to have money. In fact, it was uh, said that the government needs about $13 billion, I think for the next 10 years, to really put Nigeria in a place where infrastructure is at an optimally provided level. 
and we ask ourselves, where is this money going to come from? And if it does not come from uh, an economy that is being run or being managed in a responsible way that is productive, where the government focuses more on eliciting taxes uh, in, in an accountable fashion, taxes from companies that are regulated appropriately, fairly and justly, or taxes from citizens that have a, an environment that is that promotes their livelihoods, that is safe and encourages them to do business. You know, these are the things that Nigerians want. And it would not be a, a tall order to ask Nigerians, you know, to pay taxes where these things are being provided in more timely, efficient, and accountable ways. So, I mean, there's no, there's no pleasure in saying that the incoming government will inherit numerous debts and it will it will take a lot of political will to ensure that you know the the nation becomes productive enough perhaps also cleaning up the oil sector which is another kettle of fish on its own and bringing these monies into a proper organized framework where they are spent in the most in the most efficient and effective ways you know for the benefit of nigerians Thank you so much, uh, Viola, for your time on the show today. And in terms of following the money, we'll definitely have another conversation as to see how much Nigeria can do better in terms of developing a stronger framework for better budget implementation. And then we'll also rate the performance of the Treasury single account, especially as part of the government's public financial management uh, strategy. Thank you so much once again for your time on the show. Well, that's it for the part two of our interview segment. It's now time to bring you the latest from the Nigerian Exchange as we have Markets Editor Efink Ekop in the studio. And I also have over the phone the Vice Chairman of High Cap Securities Limited, Mr. David Adori. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Adori. joins us via phone. Hello, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Yes, Mr. Dory, the market is closing positive today. The all share index is up 1.35%. Is this a flash in the pan? And what are the fundamentals playing out today? Okay, uh, well, the equities, the market started a little bit bearish yesterday. And perhaps um, we just started rising and not fully predict yet because. Uh, we seem to have very poor connectivity there with Mr. Adorn by how market editor I think a cop in the studio. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking because you weren't so optimistic yesterday that we were going to see the bulls take the day. But what's playing out now? This is quite a big margin, 1.35%. Very big indeed. Coming on the back of great performance by GT Holding and uh, MCN Nigeria. Indeed, I can count up to 10 uh, prize gainers. Exactly. You know, this uh, afternoon. From mid trade, we saw many of them rising very high. It's on the back of uh, investors' expectation of uh, the rest of. Uh, uh, have year report. You're already uh, having a shifted border uh, sentiment. Yes, Others might likely be a good with the market now. <laughs> <laughs> so, as many of these companies are bringing the half year results now mm. and they're perusing the results, as it, then you see them reacting. Don't forget that uh, the mm. losses that these companies have had in the last uh, few weeks and months have. Uh, combined Been to reduce weight, yeah. their values and prices mm. seriously. And so these cheap uh, uh, securities mm. available, you know, appear very attractive to those who have investable funds. Don't forget, I said to those mm. who have investable funds, because that's even the problem now. With this uh, great inflation, uh, call it hyperinflation in the economy, mm. People don't even have enough, you know, to go around current expenditure, then to save and then invest. Mm. That's the problem. That's the reason why you see stocks are very, very cheap, but patronage it seems to be, you know, very, very low and minimal. Mm. So um, we thank God that um, market has performed very well today. Today is only Tuesday, the second day <laughs> in the week. So we have three so, days to go. So mm. who knows how it will be. 
So we never yeah. can tell where the pendulum is going to swing I because that you, market uncertainty not, will still not, linger for a while. It, it is not possible to be predictable mm. now. You know, investors have gone through great fatigue, mm. you know, trying to swift ways and then match up with funds and then expectations. That somehow. But let's hope that um, hope will be rekindled. We have great threats to uh, mm -hmm. market activities. That is political, you know, maneuvering. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can't, uh, uh, you know, stop it. We must uh, have new sets of leaders to take over, uh, you know, governance and the economy. But somehow, uh, we hope they will be able to look at the way the economy is being pressured and then think about and carry it along. I but, think globally as well, the watch yeah. word is cautious optimism. We very, cannot very be. cautious. You see markets are turning down and then exchange is very, very low. And that makes so, an element of liquid funds is just very, what also very, very serious, <laughs> makes very serious. it a, a difficult terrain. It is terrain. worse for us here in the sense that we are not productive enough. Mm. That's the mm. thing. And we don't have various items to sell to end the dollars. Mm. And especially as we are also have an inflation also deal heavy blows to the country. So many people are now looking at the treasury bills and bonds market as well. The fixed market income space is now having the more attractive look. Exactly. But then we still have to think about the great role that the capital markets brings to, to the fore. You know, mm. to serve you know, manufacturing companies. But so NGX has always had this resilience body language, and we just hope that definitely... I hope the resilience will you know, continue. <laughs> thank you so much for your time on the show today, Finger Cup. We'll definitely you. have this conversation again tomorrow as we cross over and gradually wrap up the first week of the month of August. Thank you, David. But our shift in focus to the international front, Asian stock markets tumbled today as jitters about an escalation and Sino-U.S. tension with the United States House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi set to begin a trip to Taiwan, adding to fears about the risk of global recession. U.S. long-term Treasury yields dropped to a four-month low, pulling the U.S. dollar down amid a bid for safer assets after China threatened repercussions in the event of the visit by Nancy Pelosi to the South Road Island, which China claims as its territory. Japan's decay lead 1.54%, while Taiwan's stock index also dropped 1.87%. Now, Chinese blue chips, the CSI 300 index, also tumbled 2.4%, and Hong Kong Hang Seng index lost 2.71%. Meanwhile, Australia's equity benchmark was just about 0.23% lower after an earlier decline of 0.7%, while MSI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan retreated 1.33%. Now, U.S. E-mini stock features pointed to a 0.44% lower risk start for the S&P 500, which stumbled at about 0.28% overnight. And I'll bring you more from Australia. The central bank has raised its benchmark rate for a fourth run in month, but tempered guidance on further rate hikes as it's forecast uh, fast inflation, but also slow down in the economy. The Reserve Bank of Australia earlier today announced that it has lifted its cash rate. That's the rate the central bank charges commercial banks for loans by half a percentage point to 1.85%, marking an eye-watering 1.75 percentage point of hike since the month of May in the most drastic tightening since the early 1990s. The Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Philip Lowe, maintained that the decision was taken as a dovish move by the board to get rates to a neutral level of at least 2.5%, where it theoretically will neither stimulate nor retard economic growth. Uh, Mr. Lowe also updated the RBA's economic forecast, saying consumer price inflation is expected to peak at 7.75% compared with the earlier forecast of 7% and even what played out in the June quarter at 6.1%. And bringing you some more reports now, we also have crypto player Nomad, which has been hit by a $190 million theft uh, accusation making at the latest uh, hit that we are seeing the economic player, the cryptocurrency player face, especially in the latest highs to hit the digital asset sector for this year. And according to reports, $190 million worth of users' cryptocurrencies were stolen, including Ether and a stablecoin USDC. 
Now, reports also show that the San Francisco-based Nomad has notified law enforcement and is working with blockchain forensic firms to try to identify the account involved and get back their funds. Nomad, which last week raised $22 million from investors including major US exchange coin Base Global, makes software that connects different blockchains. Now, digital ledgers are also underpin most uh, cryptocurrencies. Blockchain bridges have also increasingly become the target of thefts, which have long plagued the cryptocurrency sector, as over $1 billion have been stolen from bridges so far this year. And wrapping up business news now, oil prices on the international market slipped today, absorbing a, a bleak outlook for fuel demand with data pointing to a global manufacturing downturn, just as OPEC plus producers meet this week to decide whether to increase supply. Yes, West Texas Intermediate Crude recorded a price dip of 0.22% to sell at $93.68 per barrel. Brent crude now sells at about $99.70 per barrel, registering a downward price margin of 0.09%. And Bonilite's performance is still maintaining uh, its red zone territory at $118.10 per barrel, with a price decline of 3.25%. And for the OPEC basket, crude oil dealers offer $110.80 per barrel, recording a price decline of 0.05%. Well, that's it on the show today. Make sure you catch me tomorrow, same time as we do the midweek edition. Bye for now.